Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through the Fate Forge books. These are something I just found on Drive Through RPG. Now the thing, this is just kind of incredible. I can't believe I stumbled on this, and I can't believe that these are pay what you want. So this is about 1,500 pages, all said and done, of a. It originally comes from France, but it's translated into English. You can tell occasionally that it is a translation that's not so great, but most of the time it's awesome. It's just a clear, good, uh, clear translation of a sort of fifth edition uh, D and D variant. I mean, it basically is 5th edition D&D for all intents and purposes, except there are some changes. Definitely, I think it's more power-focused. Uh, it's definitely a bit more uh, power-creepy than 5th edition. But that's not really what you're getting these books for. Because, first of all, they pay what you want. All four of them, you can get them for free if you want. But it's 1,500 pages of incredible world-building and art. And when I say world-building, I mean, like, everything is woven into the mechanics. So... Instead of just having generic fighters and rogues and paladins, every single class has been worked so that reworked and, and, and modeled to fit into the world that is being presented here. So it's not generic. Even though 5th edition often has that sort of you know, vanilla D&D tone, everything here, as you'll see, has been made to fit into the world itself. And that's awesome. And, and that includes skills, backgrounds, classes, spells, everything has been reworked into this new form. So the, the, again, this is four books, four PDFs. The first one is the Adventurer book, which is the player's handbook, basically. Uh, that's 402 pages. The second book is the Grimoire, the spell book. This is where it deals with all the spells and variant rules for magic, which there are a ton of variant rules for magic. Way more flavorful than 5th edition, way more interesting. This is 322 pages. You've got the Monster Compendium, which is 418 pages, and I think this is my favorite book. The Monster Manual is incredible. Um, so cool. And then you've got the Lore Book and the Encyclopedia, and this is basically the DM's Guide of the World. Um, there is no DM's Guide with, like, generic rules uh, in 5th in edition, right? The DM's Guide in 5th edition has, like, rules for different genres, rules for building your own world, rules for this, that, and the other thing. This book doesn't have any of that because it's not system neutral. It's not, it's not setting neutral. This is built into the world of Ayana, and so the, um, I think that's how you could say it, Ayana. And so the encyclopedia, the DM's guide, is system-specific, which means it just goes right into the world itself. And there's tons of great ideas in it. So these books, again, if you have the time to even skim through 1,500 pages, you can go pick these up right now for free. So I would definitely recommend that just as a, as a start. I'll put the links below to where you can get them on DriveThruRPG. But I'll go through a few of these. I'm not going to go through every page, obviously. That's way too much. 1,500 pages. But just look at the quality of these books. Look at the beauty of these books. Um, this is incredible. you got a good... Um, now, it's not... Uh, uh, it is hyperlinked. So the table of contents is hyperlinked. But it's not... Um, it's not... You know, it's just it's just the basic D&D 5e. Basically, like the, the rules you're going to be looking at in this book are basically 5th edition D&D. With a few modifications and examples. But there's a great way of making this a bit more... Uh, the layout a little bit easier to read. So there are these modular, it's a modular system, and there are these tags that it'll show throughout the book for any optional rules. And they're basically, if you want the game to be more action-y, you use the optional rules that are tagged with the action little, you know, circle uh, image. And if you want them to be more, uh, more about the awakening, which is sort of like this in-world idea of your character becoming more attuned to magic, you can use the awakening optional rules, or the dark optional rules, the gritty optional rules, etc. So it's a really cool little tag system as you read through the book to see the optional uh, rules of the game. And then there's the dragon image, which is like not modular, it's important. You need to make sure you don't skip that information. I think that's cool too. So there's a little... Uh, icon system right away to tell you how to read this book and it flows through all four of these books It's how to create your characters and again it's just basically fifth edition D&D in terms of the races and the classes there's an additional class but it does cover um, a lot of the different a lot of different stuff in this book so how do you, how do you determine your ability scores uh, restricting your maximum ability scores well-rounded party advice Ted the deft charmer which is a kind of you know uh, example character and, I mean, just again, the art in this book is gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. Um, you have the Fate Forge, which is what the system is named after, and it's sort of this dream place, a maze, and uh, really cool stuff there. People are chosen to kind of go into it and throughout their lives to become, you know, kind of chosen ones or something like that. 
And then after the uh, Fate Forge section, you get just different, you know, again, this is all mostly world building, but then there's some particular um, optional ways of looking at this. You know, do people envy them? Do they fear them? Do they admire them? And then choosing which one that is, or, or leaning into one of those will change the tone of your game. If, if the people admire, uh, you know, the fate chosen, then it's going to be a more heroic, you know, superhero-y tone, more action-heavy tone. If you if you do the envy, then it's going to be more dark and gritty, right? Uh, so that's really interesting that they, that they give you those options of ways of looking at this. You know, how, do, how are adventurers perceived? Well, here are three examples of how you might do it, and this is how it's going to change the game or the tone of the game. That's cool. There's the cosmology, the world, a brief rundown of everything, like the civilizations of this world. And again, the, 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 uh, the art here, the maps of the world is really cool. Um, your character starting civilization, you can roll for that. And then the languages that you know, the writing system there, the peoples there. I mean, it's just a whole fleshed out world, gorgeous fleshed out world. The fabulous flying islands of the Aeolian are a world of wonder whose inhabitants travel in flying vehicles called Nephelatrons. Depending on the altitude, winds, clouds, and man-made adjustments, the isles can take extremely varying aspects. One can spend years here and not meet a single soul if, as if one were alone in the world. Daring adventurers explore this mysterious region and fight air pirates or come here to seek an entrance to the astral plane. Then there's the free city, which is like this big, this massive city in the middle of the world where most people come, and so there's... You can play an urban campaign there, and there's tons of monsters and things that are specifically in the city, in the, the city book. Factions and things like that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an entire place that you can spend a lot of time on. It's really awesome. So species, this game has species, but they're basically the, the, the player's handbook's core races. There's Dragonborn, but look at this art for the Dragonborn, right? It's not just a generic Dragonborn. This guy's like an alligator person. It's, it's, it's so cool. The art in this book is fantastic, and it draws you right in to the uh, to the world, um, and then there are again optional things you could do, like the disappearance of white and silver dragonborn. And then you've got the Dvergan, which are the dwarves, the last bulwark against the ravagers of Canker. Uh, guild masters is an optional rule you could include. Uh, dwarf traits, and basically they're and with guardian dwarves and builder dwarves, you basically have the five um, the uh, fifth edition you know, mountain dwarves and hill dwarves. But they're slightly different. Um, they have uh, slightly different abilities. So mountain dwarves in this don't get proficiency with all of that. They get bonuses to wisdom and shields, and then they have advantage against madness and corruption spells. Um, and uh, they, uh, they can resist corruption easier, um, corruption magic, which is a whole optional set of rules in the game. Um, I think it's pretty key to the idea of the system, but you could leave it out if you wanted. You have the elves and learning how to trance, which is a cool idea. Elves don't just naturally trance yet, they have to learn of it. And different elf traits, light elves or sap elves or drow. And you have gnomes. And again, the, the idea here is pretty much 5th edition, but it's made specific to this world, which, you know, you kind of always have to do, but it's done in a really cool way halflings, um, and then humans, of course, uh, Melisse, the half-elves, Merosi, the half-orcs, uh, tieflings, and then you get your character's history. And again, I just look at the art in this book. I, I, I can't believe that this dang thing is free. I really can't. Beautiful. All the backgrounds that you go through, um, and a lot more uh, just ways of connecting your background into the actual world itself. Alignment and ideas of alignment there. Different optional uses for inspiration. Instead of just using it to re-roll your die, you can also use it to double your movement speed for one round or ignore exhaustion for one round or remove a temporary mental condition or re-roll a damage roll. Really good ideas there for using inspiration in new cool ways. Classes. And then access to magic via the awakening because um, you, you have to have had this sort of experience there. And you can either say you're awake by default, or you can cross class into a spellcasting class and have your awakening later. There are rules here for elusive magic. So you have to roll randomly to get your spells and you don't automatically learn them as you level up. You have to actually go uh, and get them in the world, which is a cool idea. It's more old school in that way. And advice about teamwork and complementarity. Um, and then a summary of the class features. Like what what are you talking about here in terms of uh, in terms of your spells? 
and tool proficiency, skills, languages, etc. Just at a glance, you can kind of get a brief rundown of each of these classes. And you've got the Barbarians. They're pretty much Barbarians for 5th edition. Now, this is where you can see that the classes are mostly the same as 5th edition, if you're familiar with them. But not always. The subclasses are different. Again, they're specific to this setting. So you got the Path of the Wizard Slayer, for example, which is totally new. Spellbreaker Rage. Really cool idea. Um, look at the heart. I mean, I love that piece. It's so cool. The Bard. Gorgeous little city scene there. Bard stories. Uh, in colleges of the Bards here. You've got the Cleric, which is cool looking and kind of creepy. There's the Entropic Deities and the uh, Harmonic Deities. Um, again, basically the same idea as 5th edition. Different domains as well. And they got the Druid. And then you have Fighters. And I love the Fighters in this game, especially the Thug, which is the replacement for the, um, for the uh, what do you call it, Battlemaster. And... This is one of, one of the ways that the game definitely is a power creep, and this is a good example of it. So in, as far as I can tell, in 5th edition, the Battlemaster has these maneuver dice, right? And you can use them up to, up to your max number, and you get some of them back on a long rest, and you get them back on a long rest, or a short rest or something. I think it's a long rest. And you, um, you can use them to use these maneuvers, these cool you know, extra tricks that you can use in combat. They deal a little extra damage, and they do something. They you know, impose a condition or whatever it might be. Well, the thug gets to do the same thing. He gets to add these sorts of attacks to his, or these sorts of conditions to his attacks with a little extra damage there. But there's no maneuver dice. There's no, there's no um, resource pool that you're using up here. So you just, you just get to use these. You get to add these to your attacks. It seems to me to be the case. I can't see any rule here where you have a limit to how many you can use a day. You just get to add them to your attacks. It's real strong. Really, really strong, um, but it's really cool. I like that. I think that makes um, it makes more sense. Like, how do you just forget your maneuvers in combat? Well, if the whole system is powered up, then you don't need to worry about that. So you don't. But again, that means you're going to have a, a stronger system. Some players are going to love that. Some DMs are going to find that fun. Some are not. So if you already found 5th edition annoying because it was too strong, the players are too strong, well, then you're probably going to find this annoying. But I think the monsters have also been rebalanced in, in favor of, or to, to help keep up with that. Um, yeah, just great classes here. Now there's a new one, uh, the Scholar. This is a new class specifically for this system. So you have, uh, basically, if you don't want to play a magic campaign, you could just add the Scholar in. And they have like tricks, <laughs> which are kind of like, I mean, they're a little like magic, right? But they're not, they're not actually magic. Um, and you just get to spend these trick points to do special things in combat or elsewhere. So swiftness is the one you automatically get, but you get a couple more at level one. Swiftness is in the middle of battle, you are able to act efficiently and without losing a second. On your turn, you can spend one trick point to take the dash, help, or search action as a bonus action. Alternately, when you use the help action to aid a friendly creature in attacking a creature, you can spend one trick point to extend the range of this action to 30 feet instead of the normal 5. You can also do this as a bonus action for a total of 2 trick points. Okay, so you get sort of more control and stuff like that. Uh, an interesting class, the Scholar, with different pursuits. Alchemy, Healer, Pharmacist, the Philosopher's Mind Delving, um, and then of course the Sorcerer. Great class here, great art relating to it. And then the Warlock with uh, interesting um, patrons. You have the Archfiend, but you have the Primeval one. And then the Wizard, which of course, you have a Wizard. Instead of having like Abjurer or Conjurer, you get certain specializations like the Disenchanter, the War Mage, the Elementalist, the Mystifier, which probably relate more or less to the same archetypes from 5th edition, but they're re-flavored and they're built into the world, which is really cool. You get the languages here, which are all, um, not all, but they have scripts that are associated with them, which is really cool. Uh, and then secret languages, reading and writing, customization options, 
and then the rest of the book, like the feats. And the feats are similarly really cool, flavorful, and slightly stronger, it seems to me, than the feats in 5th edition, but some of the more problematic feats from 5th edition, like Lucky, or War, uh, Battle Map, whatever it was, um, uh, you know, uh, the two that were really, really good, you can take the minus 5 to hit and the plus 10 to damage, those are gone. But instead you get things like Devastating Criticals, which gives you a crit table, <laughs> or Barfly, where you get Dark Vision, if you don't already have it, and Poisoning doesn't make you bad at hitting people, which makes sense. Uh, so there's a really a lot of really cool... Um, uh, a lot of really cool feats here. Like Marksman in this one is you cannot have disadvantage to your attack unless you have it from multiple sources at the same time. You ignore half cover. And in this one, it's simply you add plus two to your damage and you crit on 19 or 20. So it's really strong, um, but it's not minus five to hit plus 10 damage. It's plus two damage, you ignore cover, can't have disadvantage unless you have it from multiple sources and crit on a 19 or 20. Which could be really good for a, a thief. For example, a rogue with sneak attack. Critting on 19s or 20s means you're going to double your crit. Or a paladin. Or a paladin who can smite. Well, a ranged paladin would be really interesting to, to do. Um, so there's a lot of really cool feats here. And then the rest of it is, uh, you know, stuff for your system. I'm not going to go into the rest of this book, but you get the point. The art is awesome. The uh, <laughs> This is the page on gemstones. It's so cool. <laughs> Ornamental stones, semi-precious stones, organic stones, gemstones. And then lifestyle expenses, stuff like that. So this is the core book. Absolutely incredible. I'm just going to, yeah, I'll just flip through and just pause on any, oh, look at the armor tables. <laughs> you get actually good, awesome pictures of the of the different armor as you're going through at least an example of each kind. That's so awesome. Different tools, uh, a beautiful piece of art with dragons fighting in the distance. Um, just incredible i love this one of the guys going down into this overgrown ruin there's a dude down at the bottom by himself while the other three are up top i just love that Ooh, that's an awesome picture of dragons you know just incredible pieces of art it feels like fifth edition from an alternate universe right like that that, that looks like something from a magic card honestly underwater combat it's a gorgeous piece of art there really really crazy Really, really incredible that this book is free. The MSRP at the back says 50 bucks. I can see why, but it is pay what you want on DriveThruRPG right now. So I would recommend going and getting this one. I'm going to go through the other books quickly, but this is just, you know, a kind of a must pick up. It's, it's so good. All right, so you got the Grimoire. This is the spell book. And I love how it's laid out to look like an actual book. All of them are like that, but this one in particular, it feels like it. Um, there's a modular system once again. I love that. The laws of magic, like an illuminated manuscript. It's gorgeous. And then these are the optional rules, very often. Not always optional, but sometimes optional rules that you can use in this game. Corrupt spells, elusive magic, simple rituals, complex rituals. Uh, you've got the rules for casting a spell and all of those things, the power of words, finishing a sentence with a spell, recognizing spell casting, whispered spell casting, loud and clear. So all the different rules for how you can say spells, maybe. Optional rules. Maintaining and monitoring spells, destruction of material components, uh, cover and areas of effect, which you you know you need to see, which is great. Good illustrations for that sort of thing. The schools of magic with an associated image or symbol for each one, which is helpful as you go through the book. Arcane specialties, specialists, I should say. The light of magic, which is a really cool rule where magical energy radiates certain kinds of light. So there's certain colors or lack of color that goes along with particular spells, and that can help or hinder you right if you're a caster in total darkness and you have to cast a spell well people can then see you a little bit because you cast um you know you cast abjuration and uh there's well as a, a, a luminescent amethyst color or conjuration is milky iridescent light sometimes sparkles with silvery hues as you cast a conjuration spell so if you cast that in the dark people can spot you and maybe shoot you or something like that living magic capped bonuses critical magic so these are just all rules that go into uh, magic here in this world, different uh, special arcane ge ge geomagical phenomena, which is awesome. Geomagical phenomena, so regions of arcane abundance, regions of arcane aridity, arcane deficiency, arcane sanctification, burning sap, all these cool things, a psychic wall, a thaumaturgic halo, different kinds of madness and the ways you can go mad from spells or otherwise, corruption, it's casting spells in bad ways or uh, casting certain kinds of spells, 
give you corruption, and there's a list of corrupt magic in this book. And again, it's optional, you don't have to use it, but you certainly can. And then how, how corruption builds up in you and how it changes you, and uh, what that might look like, and what might happen to you as a result of that magical corruption, and then how to deal with magical corruption, how to prevent it, or to postpone it, or to reverse it, if you possibly can try. And then you get the part two, which is the spell compendium, and this is just lists of spells. And it goes through, in beautiful form, lists the entire spells from the game alphabetically with sometimes great art that goes along with it, sometimes optional rules associated with that spell, like Animate Dead, which is, the optional rule is, it is possible to cast the spell as a non-corrupted one by making a pact with death. That's incredible. So you can cast this spell, but you kind of have to become a quasi-warlock to do it. You have to make a pact with death. And then there are conditions for that spell to not be um, your enemy and to not make the spell corrupting because it's a corrupting spell to use Animate Dead. One of the rules for resurrection, there's an interesting set of rules for resurrection, but one of the optional rules for resurrection is if you try to sneak past the gods of death or the, the gods and try to cast resurrection on your own power, you can do it but then it's automatically corrupting and it also you know draws their ire whereas if you cast resurrection with the under the aegis of the gods then you know you don't have to worry about that because it's really them doing it that's super cool and there are optional rules for all of these things call lightning calm emotions chain lightning chill touch a lot of these are the D, &D 5e spells but then there are more um there are some of them that are kind of added in and made to be more um more interesting or just completely new spells. Contingency is a great spell, a great example. You basically pre-cast any other spell um, as a contingency. And then at any point in the next 10 days, as long as you have the idol that you've cast the spell into on you, this little image of yourself in ivory, then as soon as the condition that you've stipulated takes place, the spell that you cast first goes off. So for example, if you cast water breathing and then the contingency spell at the same time simultaneously, Water breathing would go into effect when you X, whatever you said happened. So when I'm engulfed in water, great, then water breathing goes off. And water breathing is a verbal spell, so if you fall into water, you can't cast it on yourself if you start drowning. So contingency would make it so that if you think you're likely to fall into water and start drowning, well, now you have water breathing. Stuff like that. Really cool, really cool. Um, I really like these spells, and I like the way that they're laid out. And again, they're just gorgeous. Every page is just gorgeous. This is the kind of spellbook that makes 5th edition just like, I mean, I think if 5th edition were like this, right, people wouldn't hate it. <laughs> even if people didn't like the system, even if people were like, well, it's too powerful, yeah, it's not my system of choice, there wouldn't be the same sort of, I think, um, real dislike of the game for a lot of reasons, and a lot of them are, you know, a lot of them have to do with Wizards of the Coast, and a lot of them have to do with Hasbro, and a lot of them, so, you know, leaving that step aside, I mean the actual game itself, people would be like, yeah, it's not my choice. But there would be no, I don't think you could hate this, because it's still gorgeous. <laughs> it's gorgeous, and it's a lot of work has been put into making it coherent and cohesive, uh, and just a, a, a delight to read, with the little, uh, you know, the different kinds of spells on the side, uh, the different kinds, sorry, excuse me, the different kinds of, um, artwork on the side, the, the, the motifs, the little touches throughout this book. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Going through VW, uh, and then all at the end. And then you have references at the end, the appendices, appendices. You have a magical lexicon, which goes through. And then you have the spells listed by class. You, what's interesting is that you have the spells listed by class after the list of spells by alphabet, or alphabetically, which is reversed in 5th edition. And I think it's cooler because it's keeps, it's, it keeps the book less, I don't know, gamey and more in-world artifacty, like it's an appendix to look up the class level thing, right? That's not the actual book itself. The book itself just has the spells laid out, like it's a grimoire. Super cool. And then the list of spells by schools of magic, which I don't know why isn't in any book of spells. I mean, it, it's in a lot of them, and it's in this one, but it's not elsewhere. So you have abjuration. Okay, what are the cantrips? Ab abjuration cantrips, or the first level ab abjuration spells, or second level abjuration spells. Really cool. So I'm glad they have that. And then a list of corrupt spells, the spells that are intrinsically or potentially corrupt. Some common potions, and that's that book. So this one is awesome as well. Really cool, flavorful spell book uh, to give to your players or to keep yourself. Um, but of course, they can get it for free. Fate Forge, Epic Tales in the World of Ayana, number three, which is Creatures. This one is, I think, my favorite. 
So you have, the, the way the book is broken down is you have encounters based on region. That might not be to everyone's taste. Sometimes having it completely alphabetical seems better, but having it by region makes sense too. If you're going to be playing in this area, here's a, 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 here are the kinds of creatures you're going to run into. Believers is the first section, right? So priests, acolytes, cultists, citizens, commoners, nobles, specialists, soldiers, guards, scouts, knights, and veterans, gladiators, elite soldiers, champions. And then in the laboratories and libraries, you can get animated chains, flying swords, animated armor, rug of smothering. Look at this page. I, I love these two pieces of art. Gorgeous. The rug of smothering, that blue, is so vivid. And the animated armor just looks so good, exactly as I picture it in my mind. Way more flavorful and in-world. Like, this is like someone drawing or painting or, you know, it, uh, illuminating <laughs> this particular uh, book rather than just a print on a page, which is kind of the way it does, it comes across in a lot of monster manuals. And sometimes, I mean, you have pieces, like, uh, pieces of art like the Arcanist here, which looks more like what you'd see in 5th edition books, but then you get actual art, like the Apprentice Wizards or these guys, or the, the, yeah, the Gelatinous Cube, which is so good. I love that piece of art, squeezing through the columns. Oh, that's delightful. Avunculus, the Mimic, Rules for creating a mimic, as players are probably going to want to do that at some point. Pseudo dragons, the house, which is sort of a giant fey thing, an evil house that wants to eat you. And then the first of the dragons, the agate dragons. I think that's how you said agate dragons. Wormlings, young, adult, ancient, and then a lair, which is really cool. And then a particular one, a thousand faces. Long ago, a thousand faces was an honorable agate dragon. Now, however, it is a patient and corrupt monster, and one of the greatest dangers that the free city has faced. The adventurers may see them as an ally and supporter, realizing only later that the dragon is, in fact, their worst enemy. So, what's interesting about this is that um, this is a dragon that can change its shape, essentially. And there are a thousand forms, <laughs> but also... It can change shape into anyone it wants. Any any humanoid it wants to look like, it can change its face. Um, but there are two that it um, two primary identities that do that, that it acts through. And one is Althea, the politician, and the other one is Lysander, the assassin. That's so cool, right? So you have these two characters who are known in the city, one at the top levels, one at the bottom levels, getting things done acting, you know, extending its, extending the power of a thousand faces, doing what a thousand faces wants to do, and there's the same person. So the players might interact with Lysander the assassin as an assassin. They might interact with Althea the politician as a politician. They don't know, right, that they're the same person. I think that's so cool. Uh, you could build an entire campaign around this idea that there's this one shape-changing dragon manipulating the city, killing people, its enemies, doing all this stuff, and you have to build up to it, fighting it, finding out about it, finally killing it. So cool. This whole book is full of stuff like that. Crime barons, doppelgangers, the rules for how doppelgangers come to existence are awesome. Rules for creating a nemesis. Those players are going to have nemeses, right? Were rats, uh, urban fauna, so cats, <laughs> cockatrice, dogs, rats, uh, swarms of rats, ravens. Then encounters in Drakenberg, which is a different place. So you've moved away from the Three City and into Drakenberg, uh, which is more wild. <laughs> Jade the pickpock cat. Uh, the silver metallic dragons. And a silver dragon's lair. Wolves and foxes. Wolves and foxes. Ascomar's lava. The great Ascomar volcano. You've got the ashen kegs. Which are like, you know, on kegs, but made horrific and grotesque. I love this ashen, ashen regikeg. The queen. Lizards, Azers, Magma Mephits, Magmen, Salamanders. A lot of the stuff is straight out of D&D. I mean, in fact, much of it is straight out of D&D, 5e. But you've got um, great art, sometimes optional rules, a haunted creature, a haunted tree, for example, how to make haunted things, owl bears, where they come from, and how to make them, you know, like, where did they come from? And and what is about what, what is there that's true about them? Uh, and optional rules for each of them. Skeletons, great art for the skeletons here. Um, minotaur skeletons, stone giant skeletons, spiders, uh, hate spiders, vampires. Uh, such a creepy piece of art for the vampire. I love it. Absolutely love it. So cool.
goodness. All right, well, this book is similarly incredible, as you can hopefully tell. Great art for all of these creatures. Hobgoblins, kobolds, bugbears, orcs. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, this book is similarly awesome. I don't know if I'm going to flip through the rest of it because we're only 238 pages out of 418. Mounts of the Great Kong Axe Beaks. So you guys get the point. An awesome, awesome, awesome book. Oh, there's the Bulette. So good. Oh, okay. Well, I highly recommend this book on its own. Just, just this one book because it's so flavorful. So many good ideas about classic D&D monsters with a lot of great inspiration. Finally, we have the fourth book, which is the Encyclopedia. Now, this is mostly world building and talking about the world. There's some magic items in each section. There's poisons, and, but mostly it's like cities and NPCs and locations and things like that. And the first one you go through is the Free City, which is this huge city. Um, and, you know, I'm sure many campaigns, most campaigns are going to take place here, either in the city the whole time or just in and out of the city and all that stuff. Once again, you get great art, um, a really cool... Uh, rundown of the factions, great inspiration ideas here. Now, one of the things you're not going to find in this book is like a bunch of random tables for generating your own stuff. There's, there's, there's like, it's it's all built. You know, some people love that. They like having a pre-built si uh, system setting all for them, and they can just jump right in. And even if you weren't going to play 5th edition, you could get this book because it's pretty much system neutral. It's just the encyclopedia. I mean, not necessarily. There are some things that are specific. But for the most part, it's just a bunch of ideas. Like, these are the factions in the city, and they're awesome. The Salt Circle, the Moles of Thorst, the Moochers Guild, the Rag Kingdom, other criminal organizations. And then the districts of the Free City. Here's an overall map of the Free City. And then you have each district with the image of that district below. That's so cool. It's like the, the thing I'm always talking about, having sub-maps on each page. Well, they do that for the city, basically. The old Necropolis District, the Thorst Slums, the Aeolian District. you got to just, at a glance, where you are, which is really cool with, you know, particular things you can fun it, run into there, along with the tags for that location, right? So the Underground Arena is a is an action location. Um, whereas the Maker's Faces, I think that is... Hmm, I forget which the green one was. You're going to have to get familiar with the different images. Um, the Subtle Influence of the Lady of the Night, Wonders and Poisons, Treasures of the, of the Free City, Boots of Longstride, Armor of Purity, the Key of Instant Adaptation, the Frostel's Mercy... Flora's Ring of Grace, the Necklace of Secret Communication, the Personal Torch, the Armed Weapon of Arrest, <laughs> super cool, and then Poisons in the Free City. And then you have From Roots to Mountain Tops. This is Drakenberg, which is sort of the rough um, highlands of this world. And you kind of, as you're going north, it gets colder and colder and colder. The tombs of forgotten kings, the horde's descendants. Great piece of art there. The unlife of Kentigern of Glenic, Glenskeo, Gleonkeo, Gleoncio. Don't know how to say it, but it looks cool. The gods of Drakenberg. Blacksmith, Maker, Death, and Frostel. Flora, the Red, the Forgotten One, Night and Storm. Night and Storm, here you have them. The Dvergjord, the Dvergjord? Dvergjord, yeah, Dvergjord. It's cool, hard to say. The Windwalker's Cabins. I love this. I mean, how to, like, you know, good advice for building the dwarves. Not advice, but just how the dwarves are, I guess. Fjord Kingdom, Kungden. The Chorus of the Dispende. The different towns, the Wooded Valley. Uh, the Tomb of Thraluin. Drakenclad, or Port Dragon. The Maze of Mirages, the Gate of Furies. So, I mean, just so flavorful, so much cool ideas, so many cool ideas. I love this one, Dortharo's Lock, which is like this, you know, the city descending down. You've got the catacombs, you've got the Netherworld, the Guardian's Forge. The Netherworld is basically the Underdark in this. And there isn't a lot about the, uh, the Netherworld. There is a free supplement you can get, 66 Monsters of the Underdark, with a little bit of information about the cultures down there, but it's kind of like a preview of the whole book. Treasures of Drakenberg, Enchanted Gems, Adamantine Armors, Bags of Devouring, Bracelet of Fire Immunity, The Defender, Dwarven Plate. It's really cool. Ring of Regeneration. The Great Khan, 
This is like the steps, right? Where you have the hobgoblins and the kobolds and everything lives. I love that piece of art, man. That's one of my favorites in the entire book. I don't know why. I just love the ruined columns and the people like kind of walking down below them. It's such a cool piece of art. This one's great too. Cool like traveler's notes as you go through uh, the capital of Borea, which is a very small, looks like a very small town there relative to the, you know, the free city. The primeval forest, just page after page after page of great advice and uh, great world building, great inspiration. I keep saying advice, I mean inspiration. Cats, <laughs> cats are important there. So cool. The present power relationships between the different peoples there. Tila's Gulf. Oh man. You could, like, every single place I look at, I'm like, ooh, I want to run a campaign there. That's really cool. And again, as you can see, this is basically system neutral. So there, there are rules for magic items and poisons and things, but you could adapt those to your own systems. But the advice here, if you're interested in picking up a fully developed, fully fleshed out system that is flavorful, lived in, that is coherent, and that's one thing that I think a lot of people find uh, problematic about 5th edition's Forgotten Realms kind of basic setting, which is it's just so generic and everything has to fit. And so the players are like, I want to play a tabaxi psychic cleric of, you know, a genie or, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> you kind of have that subclass and those cross classes and you can build it into the world and it fits. I mean, it, it just sort of goes in. Um, this world is limited into the core book of 5th edition, basically. It's like, okay, we're going to make a world that just takes that core book and the core races, the core classes, and we're going to make it work. We're going to make it make sense as much as you possibly can. And to, the, to that degree, it totally succeeded. It's like in that way. It reminds me of Eberron. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Eberron, but I really like how the world feels, first of all, lived in. And it also feels like if there really were this sort of high magic, high steampunk stuff, it probably would end up looking something like Eberron with, you know, guilds regulating magic and all this stuff. It, it certainly wouldn't look like Forgotten Realms. This world feels realistic in the way that it deals with all of this stuff. Like it feels, I mean, obviously it's a fantasy world, it's not ultimately realistic, but it feels like, okay, I could see this actually coming into existence based on what you've set up as its principles, as the way magic works, the way that the, the, you know, the species come together, or they don't, right? All that, this would sort of make sense. So if you're interested in playing any game, but even 5th edition, especially 5th edition, in a world like this, then this book would be awesome. You should grab this. And even if you just want it for inspiration, as I've said a few times now, this book is great in terms of its inspiration. Really, really cool. Okay, well, that is the fourth book of this series, Fate Forge. You have the Encyclopedia, the Creature Book, the Grimoire, and the Core Adventures Rulebook. Once again, these things are free. Well, they're pay what you want. And I think if you want to throw them some money, you should because they absolutely deserve it. These books have had so much care and so much love going into them. Not just the art, but the writing, the world building, the mechanics. They really tried to take 5th edition and make it work in a new setting, in our own setting. And so I highly recommend checking this out again. Because it's pay what you want, you can check it out for free. And if you're just at all you know, hungry for some beautiful art, for some inspiration, or if you're interested in trying 5th edition but you don't want to do the generic Forgotten Realms setting, check this one out. Alright guys, well I hope this has been interesting and I'll see you in another video.